Notre Dame at Texas A&M. Notre Dame holds a three to two series lead. <laughs> With this being the third regular season matchup between the two, they last played each other back in 2000 and 2001. And prior to those regular season games, they met a Cotton Bowl a couple times. 87, 92, and 93, these two teed it up there in the Cotton Bowl. So should be pretty interesting. Mike Elko is the new man in charge there in College Station. Went 16 to 9 as the head coach at Duke. He had back-to-back eight-win seasons. Pretty impressive in the ACC, especially when you think about just how challenging the Duke job was prior to his arrival. He won 65% of his games, roughly, which is the best by a Duke head coach since 1945. So pretty impressive what Mike Elko was able to do. And now he steps in at Texas A&M to replace Jimbo Fisher. But here's where Jimbo Fisher excelled. Jimbo was pretty dang good. Pretty dang good these last couple of years against AP top 10 teams. Now you're going to sit there and say, well, Jimbo has a had a whole multitude of challenges when he was the head coach at AM. Don't disagree with any of that. But when there was an AP top 10 team standing on the other sideline, he was pretty solid. They won four of their last five games against AP top 10 teams. Now, none of those games were last year, but still, he has been a bit of a giant killer. In his last few years, AM has been at least, but Mike Elko now steps in. He's been a giant killer as well. We all remember his season opening victory against Clemson last year. Let's get to the question marks about this game and what might ultimately determine it. Number one, can Colin Klein, that's the new offensive coordinator for Texas AM, can his game plan neutralize a hyper aggressive defense? Here's the thing I don't think Texas AM can just line up and block them. Just going to be honest with you. I don't think they can just line up and block. All right, hey, we'll take this guy. We'll take this guy. I don't think AM with the question marks that they have along the offensive line, I don't think they can just say, hey, yeah, we got it. We can hold it down. We're going to win that battle in the trenches. No doubt about it. I don't believe that to be true. The good news is Colin Klein comes from Kansas State. And he, he played quarterback. He understands the position. But he's also super creative offensively, especially in the run game. All right. They ranked in the top 10 in the FBS in jet sweeps. Uh, they ranked in the top 10 with multiple pulling offensive linemen, in some cases three pulling offensive linemen. They crushed it in quarterback design run game. Like They did a lot of amazing things. And then when they got in the red zone, they scored. I mean, they were second in the FBS in red zone efficiency under Colin Klein. Now on the other side, defensive coordinator Al Golden been super aggressive in college football in his two years. This is year number three. They are seventh in pressure rate, 38%, and they've blitzed. They've blitzed at a ridiculous rate of 39%. That's ninth in the sport. Now, Notre Dame's strength, their defense tackles, off the charts good. Riley Mills, Howard Cross, game wreckers. So I would expect Colin Klein to be real creative with how he tries to attack this defense, knowing the strength of the team is right up the middle. Let's go next to question number two. Can Notre Dame's beleaguered offensive line block Texas A&M's defensive front. Now, Joe Alt and Blake Fisher, the two tackles from last year, they're off to the NFL. They've had a bunch of offensive linemen drafted since the 2018 draft. Notre Dame's been O-line U for the most part, but they lost their two tackles. They lost their center who transferred to NC State. They lost their left tackle who was likely to start this upcoming season in Charles Jagasaw. He tore his pec couple weeks ago. So if you look at just the offensive line, man, that's a huge question mark for Notre Dame. The other problem is Mike Elko has a history of creating a lot of pressure with a bunch of disguised blitzes, a bunch of stunts and movement and twists and things like that. And he's got some really talented pieces to attack Riley Leonard with. That's the quarterback there for the Irish. Headline in the group is Nick Scordon. He's a transfer from Purdue, led the Big Ten in sacks last year. Uh, really an, just an elite weapon off the edge. I mean, he almost is all the time standing up on the outside, but I think they might be able to move him around and, cr and create some opportunities for him. Depending on where they identify the weak link, I think you'll see Scorton on the move some. You also have two other great players, Shamar Stewart and Shamar Turner, not related. These guys are excellent 
excellent. Shamar Stewart going to play a little bit more on the edges. Shamar Turner going to be playing a little bit more on the inside. But my goodness, these guys all move around. They're extremely versatile and they're extremely disruptive. So Mike Elko is going to put a lot of pressure on that Notre Dame offensive line because that might be the weak link for Notre Dame's offense. Question number three, will Texas A&M's wide receivers be able to win against a super elite Notre Dame secondary? Now, if you look at how AM operated last year, they didn't take a ton of chances downfield. Just 10% of Connor Wigman's passes were thrown 20 or more yards downfield. But when they did, they were pretty good. He was eight of 12 on throws like that last year. Now he was banged up, but there are some question marks at wide receiver for AM. I think they have great length, but I'm still in see it to believe it mode with their speed. I think they have guys like Jade Walker, who's six foot four, can make the contested 50 50 catch. They have a guy like Noah Thomas, who's six foot six. They have Moose Muhammad, who's rock solid on the underneath and intermediate routes. And then you have the guy Cyrus Allen, who comes from Louisiana Tech. He's a big factor in the deep passing attack the last couple of years and has 12 receptions in his career on passes that were thrown 30 plus yards downfield. That's the seventh most in the FBS over the last two seasons. So keep an eye on Cyrus Allen, but there's a few others too that they're pretty excited about in the wide receiver court, but now's their chance to show it against a group that is so good across the board. Benjamin Morrison, everyone talks about Will Johnson at Michigan as a top pick. I don't think Benjamin Morrison's that different from Will Johnson. I mean, he's that good. He is amazing. Allowed just one completion of 20 plus yards last year. And remember, he was draped on Marvin Harrison all throughout their game against Ohio State in 2023. They lost Cam Hart and DJ Brown, but Christian Gray had a great first year last year at corner as well. When you targeted him, you didn't have a lot of success. And then Xavier Watts is back at safety. He was a preseason AP All-American coming into the season, and he was amazing last year. Did not allow a touchdown in coverage and manufactured a lot of interceptions, got his hands on the football, just has a real nose for the football there in the back end. So tough to tango with that Irish secondary. Question number four, is this the year that Notre Dame's passing attack finally takes flight? As we've already kind of hit, I don't think Notre Dame's going to be able to just pound it against AM right against that front. I don't see it happening like that. We know that they added Riley Leonard, but he's never been super accurate on the intermediates. He's never been crazy accurate on the downfield. The downfield accuracy is just flat out bad. For a guy that's as talented as he is, it's got to be better this year. Now, he didn't push the ball downfield very much, but when he did, he struggled. He completed just 23% of his passes that were thrown 20 plus yards downfield. Now, I think he's got decent weapons. I think that group has really improved the last couple of years. Mitchell Evans is back at tight end. He tore his ACL last year, but he's back at 100%. He's a game changer there at tight end. Jaden Greathouse is back, kind of moved all over the field. Slot, inside, outside. Jordan Faison. Solid receiver in the bowl game last year, 115 yards. He's a lacrosse player, but he's in the slot. He's got some juice. And they made three notable transfers. Wide receiver from FIU, Chris Mitchell, who's a big-time deep threat. Bo Collins, who's solid and steady, pretty productive there in 23 at Clemson. And then Jaden Harrison is a transfer over from Marshall that also has great top-end speed. A couple trends in this game, Texas A&M, 3-0 against the spread against top 10 teams at home since 2020 that's tied for third best over that span georgia and kentucky are both four and oh i'm taking the irish in this game if you look at a m if i felt better about texas a m's receivers and if i felt better about texas a m's offensive line i think it'd be a much more challenging choice but i believe that with what they're going to see against a mobile quarterback and riley leonard i think notre dame wins the game in what should be a low-scoring brawl. This is going to be a crazy physical game, a game that might be decided by one drive or another, but I think it's a low-scoring, really tough physical football game. I like Notre Dame's defense just a bit more at all three levels, but I do think that AM's defensive line is capable of taking over the game. However, still rolling with the Irish as of this moment. 